Well, a very warm welcome uh, to uh, Miami Beach Marina uh, and to the uh, third day of the 52 Super Series uh, Miami Royal Cup. The heat is uh, on. We've had uh, two uh, good days of racing and quite strong breezes. It's got a little bit lighter for today. Azura at the top of the table. I'm joined by uh, Stefan Navy who, from the uh, from the uh, Pe Paprec team, unfortunately not un unable to race. He's going to join us for the first uh, part of racing today. Say breezes are expected to be just a little bit lighter. Uh, on average, it's probably been uh, 15, 20 knots uh, over the first couple of days. Very bumpy, very uh, quite breezy, very shifty. It's been quite difficult conditions, uh, but uh, different uh, set of circumstances today as we go afloat. Uh, we've had uh, four races so far. Azura, I say, leading uh, by eight points. They had a great day yesterday with, uh, with two firsts. Stefan, your thoughts on the regatta so far? Sorry. Your thoughts on the regatta so far? Well, it's look uh, that some, uh, I mean, it was a first day was very difficult and the condition shifty and bumpy uh, like we had during our training on Saturday. So if you look at what happened to, uh, to Gladiator, you see that it's not easy to sail ar around here. So we we'll look forward to see what's going to happen today. We will indeed. Anyway, let's have a look at the, uh, the highlights video. The, uh, this is how things uh, played out yesterday. <laughs> It's a little after 7.30 here in the morning at uh, Miami Beach Marina and the 52 Super Series fleet has already left the dock in order to beat the tide, get enough water to get out uh, and get racing. Lighter winds today, we should have two races and uh, now it's coffee time. Once again here in Miami of a group of guests ready to enjoy a roller coaster ride courtesy of XS Energy Drinks. To be around some world class sailors is pretty amazing. Once in a lifetime kind of thing, you know. Totally first class. Thank, Thank you XS and Super Series! Well, the first race of the day got away in a nice uh, 10 knot breeze from 135. Still quite lumpy and bumpy, but Azura came away from the start line nicely on the pin end with the uh, Prevets and Brunasek. Not such good starts from Quantum Racing and Platoon in particular, but Azura uh, led the uh, top mark from Prevets and Brunanasek. And Azura, in fact, were almost 150 metres clear uh, during the race. Brunanasek closed right up uh, on the final run, but Azura just clinched the uh, victory with Brunanasek good second place. Yeah, first race was very good. We did not make any mistakes. We sailing fast and the result came. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> Conditions very much the same for the second race of the day. Allegra led early on from Ran. Kelvin Harrop, in fact, steering Allegra today because uh, the owner, Andy Soriano, had a damaged ankle. But uh, Allegra led early on in the race. Azura jibe set at the top mark, lost out, and were actually very near to the back of the fleet. But then they got uh, back on the second upwind. They got up to third. And then a nice final run from Azura. Just uh, nailed the last quarter of that run and finished just ahead of Platoon with Ran in third. Obviously today we, we got a perfect day results wise but especially we are happy because we will recover our, our upwind speed so that, that gives us confidence to do whatever we, we need to do on the race course trusting that the speed will be working for us so, so I think it's a positive day especially for that and it's one of those days that you need to enjoy because you know that tomorrow we start again and it can easily go the other way so we need to celebrate but for a little while because the glory doesn't last forever. After four races of standings overall, Azura leading on six points, second Platoon now on 14, Prevetsa closing up to third on 15, and Quantum Racing in fourth on 18 points. Well, that's it from Miami, from the Miami Royal Cup. Great conditions on the water. Two wins for Azura, stepping clear at the top of the table. Breeze scheduled to get lighter over the course of the regatta. We're live with the 52 Super Series TV, powered by Quantum Racing. I'm still waiting for my Lamborghini, but here's a taste of the high life.
a little taste of the uh, high life uh, at the end of that video, our uh, owner's dinner uh, yesterday evening. Uh, and uh, as we said, the uh, city of uh, Lamborghinis, martinis and bikinis. We've not seen too much of any of them yet, uh, but we have had some great racing on the water. If we look at the uh, leaderboard uh, after four races, uh, we can see that uh, Azura are at the, uh, at the top of the table. Uh, with uh, an eight-point lead after two wins yesterday, back-to-back -back wins. The deltas are very, very small. And uh, Platoon, uh, eight points behind on 14 points. Prevetsa on uh, 15, moved up. Not such a good day yesterday for Quantum Racing, a six and a seven. Uh, and Ran Racing not far behind uh, a 19. Stefan, your thoughts? Uh, you say it's uh, still pretty open. Yeah, I mean, you can see that... Um Azure had, had very good result uh, on the first and the second day, but uh, the three boat, four boats after, uh, from the, the second to the third, they are very close. They are all, all in five points, so I think it will be very uh, open for the podium. And we've seen, the, I mean, the racing's been incredibly close this season in, uh, in Key West. There was uh, very, very few points between second and seventh. I mean, what's making the difference? It's really down to meters, isn't it? Well, I think it's the start of the season and maybe some of the boats have not been training so much as before because uh, with the, um, the sh shipping to the US this year, the, the training, the, the team didn't have so much time for training. So I think it's more open and, and also all the team are trying to improve their level. So it's, everybody's getting closer. And what, uh, how do you see the, the season then panning out as we get into Europe? Do you think it'll get closer or teams, do you think teams will then move a little bit further ahead perhaps? Well, it seems to be evolving all the time, doesn't it? No, I think there's some teams that have more time for training and they will improve and they will be, uh, uh, the gap between the team will be, will be increasing over the season. And what's your own situation then? Obviously you had a problem. Unfortunately, that's uh, very disappointing for you. It's our benefit today because we do have you in the studio. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what's the prognosis for your, your team? You're looking for a mast. Yeah, we're looking for a mast. And now, now we're working on different options, uh, either to repair one that is in the UK or try to find a second-hand mast that, uh, that could fit our boat. So now we are talking with different owners and see which solution we can, uh, we can find. And ju no. just to be clear, the masts are not interchangeable, you know, for the people who are watching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all they're, the they're all custom fit fittings, yeah. all the rigging is different lengths and it's uh, very difficult to change the rigging. Yeah, all the masts are, all the boats are different, all the masts are different because they are made specially for the boat, so we have to, to find a mast that can fit to our boat uh, with not too much modification, otherwise it, uh, it will be useless. In the meantime, uh, Gladiator team, as we saw uh, on the uh, first day of racing, had a collision uh, approaching this, the uh, second win were marked in race two, and it was a, a fairly, fairly serious damage to stain to the, uh, the boat, which is brand new to the Gladiator team. And ever since then, it's been a battle, a race against time to get their, uh, their uh, red boat, the previous boat, the 2015 uh, Vrolic design, uh, which was up in West Palm Beach. And so the Gladiator team have really pulled together. They've uh, got the, uh, the boat ready. They've uh, delivered it yesterday uh, afternoon and evening. Uh, and Ed explained uh, what, uh, what the situation was to start with, how they went through the process. And this was Ed Baird. So Ed Baird, last few days have been a bit of a mission for you guys. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit tough. I mean, we had a lot of breeze trying to get the new boat going and, uh, you know, really didn't get to sail much before the event started. And then first day of sailing, have a big crash and uh, take, the event, take the boat out for this event. Hopefully we can get it back for the next one. What's it been like the last couple of days getting the other boat ready? It's been a, a, a bit of a battle. Well, everybody who puts boats together understands what a struggle it is to put everything together in a rush. And uh, that's basically what we had to do. The boat was ready to be trucked. The mast was stripped. The winches were off. The, uh, the wheels were down. The stanchions were out. Everything was ready to be trucked and moved to the next event uh, in the U.S. Um, so we had to put all that back together, and the shore team did an incredible job. And just we are all uh, keeping our fingers crossed that none of us forgot something. A great job. Yeah, well, we hope so. We're just going to get out and see if we can uh, hang in there with the group now. Good, well done. Thank, Thank you. you. So probably the toughest time uh, in the history of the Gladiator uh, team, a team which has uh, really got a fantastic uh, team spirit. Uh, and uh, indeed also there's been a lot of help and uh, solidarity from the teams round about the, uh, the boat park uh, over the last uh, 48 hours. We spoke with uh, Fergal Finlay as well, fearless Fergal, uh, a, a well-known face in our commentary team, but unfortunately he's not available today. He's trying to get a little bit of sleep because it's been so tough and he's uh, obviously the boat captain of the Gladiator and this is uh, what Fergal told us. So Fergal, it's Team Red Eye then? 
Uh, yeah, we've had a busy, busy 36, 48 hours. Um, obviously, we all witnessed one of the horrible, horrible incidents in sailing and racing. But we, we have our good days and we have our bad days. Uh, and uh, we're one of the lucky ones that we get to have a second boat, the, the, the red boat um, from 2015, uh, just parked up in West Palm Beach. So that was all packed up, ready to go uh, to its next IRC event. Um, and a team of us went up, built the rig, stepped all together, a huge team effort, contribution from everyone, and a massive amount of support from everyone here in the, in the team. It's one of the nice things about being in this fleet. It's how much you support you get from everyone willing to help you to get back on the water. So what does that mean in real terms? You know, what could have helped? Well, yeah, ma yeah, manpower. There's so many shore, shore teams here with you know, five, five guys. Yeah, and you know, if we need to borrow something to get us on the water, or we need an extra pair of hands to lift something up, or we need an extra halyard because if one's broken, then there's everyone here is willing to help us, and you know, we're we're willing to do the same when, when it's the other way around. But it's just that spirit amongst the fleet that was that is so nice. And you know, we we arrived back today after a big effort with the boat. It's ready on the water now, going out to the race course. And the amount of support of people saying, you know, nice, nice effort, and you see on social media as well, it's great to have that backing as well. It makes it all worthwhile. And uh, you've had a little bit of sleep yet, or are you looking forward to that? Um, I think I'm, uh, I've, I've asked for the day off the chase boat today, which I've been granted. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got, I got, I got two. <laughs> I think I got two hours kip on the on the delivery down here from West Palm Beach, and. Um, and then, and then one in the chair in the office this morning, one hour this morning. So. Good, good job. No, thank you. So you're not doing the live then? I think I, I think I might fall asleep. Maybe, maybe if I can get the opportunity to do it again at the end of the week, I will. But first, I need to get a bit of sleep in. Good job, well done. No, thanks very much. Cheers. So that's uh, fearless Fergal Finlay, uh, red eye, uh, red eye shift over the last couple of days, uh, and certainly looking at this, uh, should be asleep at the moment, and hopefully will join us. Uh, in the uh, in the live over the next couple of days so we understand that racing uh, is uh, postponed at the moment hopefully we can go out to uh, Stuart Struley our uh, voice and uh, eyes on the water Stuart can you hear us Stuart Struley live from the water can you hear us are we hearing Stu We don't appear to have a connection with uh, Stuart Strilly just now, but uh, we can see that it's, uh, it's pretty light uh, out there. Uh, only uh, five to seven knots of breeze was our last report. Uh, the wind angle was about 115, still to come around a little bit uh, more to the right, perhaps. That was uh, our forecast. Uh, five knots, uh, true wind speed. We can hear Stuart Strilly now. 115, one, one uh, one, one five, uh, five knots, Stu, is that right? Yeah, that, that's what they're saying out here, Andy, is, is about five knots, and that's what I'm seeing. It's been very light, and uh, it, it just it was, was pretty good when we got out here, and things looked all right, and then the breeze over the last 20 minutes has really faded uh, quite a bit, um, maybe kind of a little bit to the left, and uh, that's sort of the forecast I'm seeing on the grip files is the breeze to slowly back around to the north, uh, but the grips were also calling for about eight to nine knots, so they're missing a little bit there. So, uh, you know, it depends on how much reliability we can put on that forecast. And but so right now, everyone is just sort of in a holding pattern, waiting to see if we get a little more breeze. Indeed. And, uh, and what's the kind of mood on the, uh, in the race area then after yesterday and the day before? It was quite a lot breezier. Now is the time to uh, kind of change, get, change modes uh, and get focused into the, uh, the second phase of the regatta, where it's going to be a little bit, little bit lighter. Still quite choppy, is it? Yeah, well, it reminds me a lot of Key West, as a matter of fact, right? We started off with two very windy days in Key West, and then the breeze got real light and turned from, you know, what was more of a uh, of an athletic game, so to speak. Uh, crew work was more important, and we really had to work the boats, and now it becomes much more of a mental challenge. Uh, this is going to be a challenge. We, we talked to uh, Nacho Postigo, the navigator on Provetta, yesterday, and he was talking about how difficult it was yesterday, and he was expecting it to be more difficult today where, you know, connecting the, the connecting the dots, getting into the puffs, and then also managing the wind shifts as they come down uh, really makes for quite a bit of work for the, the, the tacticians and the strategists on board. So I think there'll be a lot of eyes out of the boat today, a lot of people trying to give some advice and, and uh, see what they can see up the course and then feed that back to the tactician who's then got to find a way to, uh, to connect everything together and put together a solid leg. But it, it's not going to be an easy race today for, by any stretch. 
Uh, also, a little bit lumpy, especially quite for this, this wind conditions. We've got, you know, probably one meter seas out here, uh, relatively uh, short, especially down here as we get close to the coast. And that's going to make a challenge to get the boats going off the line and, and out of maneuvers. And talk to us a little bit, Stu, about the geography of the race course. How does the, uh, the city affect the, uh, the race area and the Gulf Stream? Uh, Andy, I'm having a hard time hearing you there. I wasn't quite sure what the question was. Yeah, I'm just asking you, how does the geography of the uh, area affect the, uh, the breeze? I mean, obviously, we're not in an offshore breeze, but it still does affect the, uh, the, the uh, breeze over the race course, having the city behind us. Uh, and yeah, I, I just can't, I can't quite get the question there, Andy, about the offshore breeze. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't want to, I want to go on randomly, I can't understand it. Okay, well, we'll come back to you shortly, uh, Stuart, but uh, say we're uh, postponed uh, for the moment, and we'll come back to you uh, when we get into the start, uh, start period. So coming back to yeah. uh, Stefan, I'm fortunate to have a, a postponement then. Difficult, uh, difficult to have to wait for the, uh, for the start. Yeah, yeah, it's always a difficult time, but I think uh, all the the team are must be really concentrated on the 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 weather and the the racing condition are totally different today from what we had since uh, since we arrived last week. So now they have to tune the boat uh, and the rigging uh, in another way, and they have to change their way of uh, of sailing just to to fit to this new condition. And who impresses you most of all uh, through the teams? Who's your uh Obviously, quantum racing are the benchmark. Yeah, Who's, yeah, yeah. What do you see kind of moving up the hierarchy? Well, and yeah, I mean, we can see it from uh, from yesterday and the day before that Azura is in a very good uh, uh, position. And uh, I mean, two second and two third and uh, two first is uh, really fantastic. So uh, it it looks like compared to what they did in in Key West, they improve uh, a lot. And quite often we seem to see this in this uh, in this circuit where teams have a bad regatta and it really for forces them to work harder and harder and really review and then they bounce back to the next regatta is that uh, you see that quite often yeah yeah for sure i mean uh, these these guys are all professional and then when they have a bad result they they want to fight to to improve indeed i mean we've seen that where, i mean Prevetza, Prevetza were in the mix in, in key west until the last day then had another heartbreaker in the last day mm. but they're uh, they're pr progressing well a third a third and a fourth they're pretty consistent as a as a team yeah Provisa is doing a really good job since uh, last the last season you can see that uh, they improved their, their their level and that they are fighting now to be on the podium and for the first uh, place all the time and uh, Platoon, Platoon were uh, in contention in uh, in Key West, just uh, failed in the last day. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about the pressure on the last day, because that's really when everything comes to a head. How do you uh, how do you make sure you perform on the last day? What what makes a difference? I don't think we are the right team to, <laughs> <laughs> no, but to you've talk been about the, the pressure you've been on the last game day long because enough to know. Uh, that's something uh, this is. It's always difficult to work with, but uh, I mean these guy they they are on the water. 200 and 250 days a, a year, so they, they should be used to it. They are used to high level regatta, so this is something they can cope with. I'm sure uh, this is not a problem for, the, for them, not like uh, it's not about the same for, for us. What's it like for you guys then on this, on this circuit? Just give us an insight uh, behind, uh, behind the curtain, as it were. I mean, for us, I mean, it's really fantastic to be here fighting uh, against uh, all these professional sellers. You know, we, we all have our, our own uh, job uh, when we are not on the circuit. So, so it's just uh, a little insight. Who does what, you know, in, in real life away from the, uh, this, uh, this circuit and your team? You, you still have yeah. you yourself are a, f a factory manager, I believe, for, uh, for Paprik? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, I mean, in the past, we used to have a doctor, we, had a, we have a school teacher, we have um, one of the guys selling and buying houses. Uh, and and since, uh, since this, the end of last season, we have more and more people, of course. Uh, more and more professionals. Not professional, because, uh, yeah. but they are working in the selling business. They are either... Uh, uh, teacher selling, taking care of selling school, or we have young young people, You've young seller, a of young young guys, yeah, that's young guys the from the Olympics uh, circuit. So that's very good, and uh, this is helping us to improve our level. And because they are used to high level competition, they are not used to this kind of big boat because they are selling on dinghies. But uh, 
uh, we can give them some of our knowledge and they are bringing their log uh, knowledge and all this put together it's uh, we can see that it's improving the team level and how have they improved the learning curve on these Grand Prix boats is pretty steep yeah they are learning very quickly they and are what, learning what do they bring as a mix to the as a, to the team you say sometimes it's hard work behind closed doors when you have to look after them and make sure they keep the house tidy and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is that they, they are used to work very hard on their dinghy to... to so the to work ethic is there, the yeah, philosophy yeah, is yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, of course, after the race, sometimes they are, it's young seller, though, so they like to have good time. In, in, it's like more like a hobby when they come yeah, yeah. On, a, on our boat. It's not uh, there's not so much pressure as what they can have when they are preparing Olympic Games or uh, uh, a World Championship. But, uh, well, we try to put all this together, have, have a good time and learn from everybody. And in general, we're starting to see some of the other teams bringing young sailors in. We see that on, uh, on RAN Racing and also uh, Klaus Lange coming into the, uh, into the Azura programme. So I think generally this, the circuit and the class is moving forward in the right direction from that point of view, bringing more and more young talent in. Yeah, I think it's the future of the class. So if we don't bring new blood in the class, then it's... Uh, we become dinosaurs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, I'm ready to go out. <laughs> 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 Tell me a little bit more about some of the other teams. You know, it, it seems that there there are there are teams that uh, blow hot and cold. Uh, more often than not, the the problems are mechanical on the on the race course. Uh, we've seen, for example, Brennesek as an example as a team who uh, seem to be able to get up there, uh, win races, top two, top three, top four. Sometimes they have a problem like they did in the first day when they lost the, uh, the kite, kite overboard yeah. and stuff. Is That's just uh, pressure or is that...? I, I don't know what's happened on Brendan Ozek. I don't know if it was a technical problem or yeah. if there uh, if more crew problem. Uh, but uh, you can see that only the few top teams they can have regular results, otherwise you have a good race and then you have a, a worse or a bad race. Uh, what I would say about the class is that we are, I mean, as Paprec, we are very happy to see team like Solskjaer joining the fleet this season because it's a old boat like our boat and um, I think the spirit of their team is about the same as uh, our team spirit, so... Missing Chio a little bit, aren't yeah, we? Yeah. So it's good to, to have a team like that with all but that uh, trying to fight against uh, the professional team. So we feel that we have a closer competitors on, uh, on the race. But, uh, but sometimes, I mean, uh, as, as in... Uh, the, the thing with team like Howard is that we don't practice enough, we don't have enough training, so it's, it's very difficult to, to keep high level all the time and, and to, to have good results. After one good race, most of the time we have a bad race because we <laughs> maybe we're so we excited to and drink so much champagne. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, before racing we spoke with uh, Michele Avaldi from the Brennina Sec team and he gave us an insight into what the uh, the weather situation was going to be. He seemed uh, sounded reasonably confident that uh, we would get racing, and this was uh, Michele Avaldi, hopefully from the uh, Brennina Sec, Sec team, when we spoke with him earlier on, just before they went underwater. Michele Avaldi. All right, good. So, um, Michele Avaldi, then uh, tactician and uh, project manager for uh, Berenasek. Weather for today looks good? Yeah, it looks uh, on the light side. We'll have, um, probably as we go out, we'll have uh, eight, nine knots, and this, there's a chance that uh, the wind will drop a little bit until some uh, sea breeze uh, kicks in. But uh, it should be sailable, it should be different from the previous days, but good sailing. And uh, tell us a little bit about the current in the water there. The colors of the world. current uh, is uh, it's a big factor here because uh, we have the Gulf Stream uh, not far away and we have the tide uh, coming in and out of the channels that are pretty close. So in different areas of the course you have different current and it's for sure a factor to choose the lane or you find the, you find the lucky lane or an unlucky lane and most of the time it's more current related than uh, wind related. And you have the current pretty well mapped to you? Well, we we'll try. We're not nobody can say that there's a pretty well mapped, but uh, we're trying to have a good reading on it. Is it a particular issue on the start lines? No, it hasn't been too bad on the start line. Uh, we had uh, yesterday. There was one start that we looked at the drone footage and we said, "Wow, this is uh, bad for the fleet," because everybody was uh, 
one length behind the line, and um, but that I think was more wind related. But was uh, was uh, funny to say that all the fleet misjudged by a length. So Michele Avaldi, just uh, also touching on the uh, increasing use of drones in the, in the fleet, just to explain that uh, there are drones flown uh, by different teams or a couple of different teams uh, over the course of the race. That uh, footage is then shown or uh, available to all the teams. They all go to the, uh, in this case, the Berenicek uh, container after racing. They pick up a USB key that has all the footage uh, which is uh, shot over the course of the, uh, of the race and that allows the teams uh, a, a, an overview of the uh, the start and the mark roundings for their debriefs, and this is uh, this is a collaborative uh, uh, operation, and it's becoming more and more prevalent in the circuit, and it's allowing the teams to raise their performance all the time. And I say the uh, Gladiator team have really pulled out the stops over the last uh, 40 hours to get the uh, red boat ready. They're obviously out there and waiting to go racing, just waiting for the breeze to pick up, as we hope it will. Uh, and uh, it's a particularly special rela relationship uh, on board the Gladiator. Uh, between uh, Tony Langley, who's uh, been quite uh, reasonable success uh, with, uh, on the circuit. Uh, he's one of the uh, biggest followers. He's been in the circuit since uh, pretty much since the beginning, or certainly in the, the first year of 52 Super Series. And also his, uh, his best friend, Jeff uh, Povey, who is uh, on board uh, and has been on board uh, a long, long time with, uh, with Tony. We spoke with them uh, in, uh, in Key West and got a nice little insight into their relationship. And uh, they talked initially about how they first ever got into sailing and how it's uh, progressed through to this uh, top level of the uh, 52 Super Series. And this was Tony and Jeff uh, back in, uh, in Key West. So with uh, Jeff and Tony from the, uh, the Gladiator then, you two have been uh, friends for many, many years. How did your sailing career together start, Tony? Oh, uh, on a beach in Thailand, I think it was, wasn't it? We yeah. jumped, on a, jumped on a Hobie cat about 40 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> we just rented a Hobie off the beach, thought they look fun, pulled the sheet on, the float came out the water, the next minute we were five miles offshore, upside down. <laughs> with no idea how to get back. The rescue boat came out, spun us round, pointed it back to the beach, and we ripped back into the shore. And you're hooked ever since? Sort yeah, of. pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went out and bought a, um, a Dart 18 not very long after that, still got it. Yeah. Uh, so, sailed that at uh, Rutland, Rutland Water for a while, then up in North Norfolk. And um, yeah, but uh, big boats came a lot later. When did the big boats come, Monroe? 2006. Yeah, I did. I did my first regatta in Antigua in '94. Uh, um, that was uh, that was a great deal of fun. But um, and we went back there last year, which was which was quite nice. But uh, no, it really really started in uh, 2006 with the Atomic program. Yeah. And when did you first become friends? You've been friends since you were kids. Oh yeah, yeah, a long while, more than 50 years. <laughs> sort of the uh, yeah. same school. Um, yeah, old school. <laughs> same school, old school. Um, also, we did a lot of bare boat chartering uh, in the Caribbean with the girls. Sailed up and down the Windward and Leeward Islands, put in at little rum bars and snorkeling and diving. And that's where we first learned how to drink rum. Drink rum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not how to sail. No. And navigate and get ourselves around without getting shipwrecked. Well, that as well. But drink rum. <laughs> And do you ever kind of pinch yourselves and just think how great it is that you're all still doing it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think it's, I, you know, love every day, love every day on the water, regardless of the outcome. And what were you like as kids? It's not uh, the same. <laughs> well, fishing, we shoot together, we ski together, so we've done lots of stuff over the years, learned to dive and stuff like that. And a lot of the stuff, fishing and diving, Anything goes. Can do, I can do better. Goes <laughs> hand in hand, I guess, with the um, with boating and sailing. You know, yeah. you know whether it's water skiing or just general power boating and messing around on boats, really. But uh, this this is a this is a terrific accolade to be at this level now with some of the chaps we get to sail with. It's fantastic. It really is great. Yeah. The same for you, Tony. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's no other sport you can do. It. The, the same level of professionals on the no. boat? No, there's not. No. No, it's, uh, it is quite special. Yeah. And I'll be honest, Andy, 
the more money he spends, the more professional the crew get. <laughs> we'll leave <out> that. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks very much. You got to laugh, don't you? Uh, as as uh, Jeff Povey says, the more money Tony spends, the more professional the crew get. Uh, Under the class, uh, and uh, Stefan, I mean, the, this uh, circuit really is about the owners, isn't it? They're the guys who spend the money, and uh, they really have to be uh, to enjoy their sport. I mean, your owner included, uh, Sean Luke, he loves it. Yeah, he loves selling, and uh, what is important, of course, is that all these owners are having, having good time on the on the water. Otherwise, uh, spending so much money, if you don't have a good time, it's it would just useless. What, what's the essence of having a good time? Because it's professional sport. At the end of the day, well, I would say for our team it's a bit different because uh, we have been friends for many years yeah, yeah. with, with Jean Luc, and uh, we start something like 20 years ago uh, racing together on small boats. And um, you've done Amer uh, Admiral's Cup and you've done uh, Commodore's Cup, yeah, and yeah, we, we lots and lots of uh, offshore racing. Yeah, exactly. We were uh, more of racing in the in Europe and uh, in Brittany. Uh, on 40 feet boat, boats, so uh, we did the Admirals Cup in 2003, and then we start with the Commodore's Cup. Which you uh, won? Yeah, we did it three times, and we won it once, and uh, and that was after the, we won the Commodore's Cup in 2006. That uh, Jean Luc decided that we should go to Key West, so that was our first time in the, in Key West the year after, and we had a very very good time there. So. Uh, what he wants is to have good time. It's, it's. Uh, I mean, of course, you can have a professional team, but uh, what Jean Luc like to have is, it's to have a good dinner with the crew after, and and to talk about other things also than only uh, only selling. I think that's true with a lot of the teams. I mean, Ergen Imri on uh, Provence is another one who likes to enjoy his dinner and uh, go to nice places. And I think that's the the essence of this circuit. I think we're going to take a break until we uh, get uh, under starters order. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much just now, and join us again in a few minutes, hopefully when we get the 52 Super Series here at the uh, Miami Royal Cup uh, underway on day three. <laughs>